in the book of Genesis chapter number three. We appreciate the praise team this morning, choir. Thank you, Caitlin. Caitlin's graduating this year. Amen. Bless the Lord. Proud of her and thankful for her. And she'll be a part of our graduation Sunday, next Sunday. Amen. And we're going to have Dr. Tommy Green, who is the executive director treasurer of the Florida Baptist Convention here preaching. And my, he is a preacher. And you want to be here next Sunday as we celebrate our graduates and hear from Dr. Green. It is going to be a phenomenal day here at Pine Terrace. And we look forward to having you back uh, next Sunday. Well, today, uh, I am beginning a new a series of messages that will take us from Mother's Day through uh, to Father's Day, entitled, Heaven Help the Home. Heaven Help the Home. And the subtitle is, Heaven Help the Home, because the devil is trying to destroy it. Heaven Help the Home. Anybody here... Um, know anything about family struggles? Anybody know anything about any of that? Today's message to start off the series is entitled, The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. I wonder, can anybody testify that the struggle in the family is real? Can you testify to that? Well, we're going to talk about that today. And today's going to be a little bit different because I'm just going to take a few minutes in Genesis 3 and a few minutes in Ephesians 5 and 6, and then we'll drill down deeper on those in the weeks to come. But let's begin this way. The home today is facing a cultural crisis. There's a wonderful book by Dr. Andreas Kostenberger, who's one of our Southern Baptist Seminary professors, and he wrote, along with a co-author, Dr. Jones, David Jones, a book called God, Marriage, and Family. I highly recommend it to you. It's kind of a whole Bible look at the issues of marriage and family and all things related to that. It's kind of a family, a biblical family desk reference you can just look at and see and learn. I'd encourage you to pick up a copy of God, Marriage, and Family. But in that book, they begin this way. For the first time in its history, Western civilization is confronted with the need to define the meaning of the terms marriage and family. What until now has been considered a normal family made up of a father, a mother, and a number of children has in recent years increasingly begun to be viewed as one among several options which can no longer claim to be the only or even superior form of ordering human relationships. The Judeo-Christian view of marriage and the family with its roots in the Hebrew scriptures has to a significant extent been replaced with a set of values that prizes human rights, self-fulfillment, and pragmatic utility on an individual and societal level. It can rightly be said that marriage and the family are institutions under siege in our world today, and that with marriage and the family, our very civilization is in crisis. Strong words, but I believe they're absolutely true. We have in our country today the consequences of no-fault divorce and how that has ravaged so many families. We have the um, ever-present temptation and reality of sex outside of marriage in all kinds of ways. We have the distortions of God's design for marriage and homosexuality and the like. We have all of the issues of gender confusion that are harder and harder to even get a handle on, to have a conversation about. And here's the thing about all of those and so much more, that there are so many who see this decline as progress. And what we know is not progress, it is regress. It is decline. It is decay. It is the eroding of God's good design for the family. So the question is, how did we get here? Well, the professors in the book go on to say this, the current cultural crisis, however, is merely symptomatic of a deep-seated spiritual crisis that continues to gnaw at the foundations of our once-shared societal values. Listen to this. If God the Creator, in fact, as the Bible teaches, instituted marriage and the family 
And if there is an evil being called Satan who wages war against God's creative purposes in this world, it should come as no surprise that the divine foundation of these institutions has come under massive attack in recent years. Ultimately, we human beings, whether we realize it or not, are involved in a cosmic spiritual conflict that pits God against Satan with marriage and the family serving as a key arena in which spiritual and cultural battles are fought. So we are in, the home is in a cultural crisis that really is a part of a cosmic conflict. And so we pray, heaven, help the home. I aim to kind of show you how this works and over the next few weeks, how you can fight for your family. So we have Genesis chapter three in front of us. We're gonna just read a verse or two here uh, just so we can honor God's word and then dive together into it. Would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let me begin in Genesis chapter two and verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now chapter three, verse one, now the serpent, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? Let's pray. Father, I recognize that the enemy would not want this message preached, so please help me. Fortify me and give me strength. I pray Holy Spirit empowered help. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Come and move among us. God, help us to be people who will fight for the family. Heaven, help our homes and give us good fruit from today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We must fight for our family because our family is in a fight. We must fight for our family because our family is in a fight. I just want to show you two things this morning about the struggle, which is real. Number one, I just want to say that this is a struggle, has been a struggle from the beginning. A struggle from the beginning. When we come to the book of Genesis, we are... The curtain is pulled back and we are shown the glory and the power of our great God in creation. In Genesis chapter 1, the climax of God's work of creation in day 6 is the creation of man and woman. Then God said, Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And then at the end of Genesis chapter 1, in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then Genesis chapter 2 focuses in on that wonderful work of the creation of man and woman and God bringing the two of them together. God made Adam to sleep after no helper was found suitable for him, and out of his rib he made a woman. He formed and fashioned a woman and then the Bible says that he brought her to the man. God gave the first bride away. He made her and then he gave her away to the man. And the very first recorded words 
of a human man or woman in the Bible are the words of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, and they are a poetic description of the one standing in front of him. That is romantic. Nicholas Sparks has nothing on the Bible. I'm just telling you right now, amen. (laughs) And when God made her and God brought her and Adam saw her, he said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then the editorial comment of Moses, therefore a man shall leave his father. This is the pattern for every marriage that was to go forward from this day. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And then this beautiful idyllic statement and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now physically, yes, but more than that, they were not, there was no place for shame, no need for shame. They were completely open and vulnerable one to the other, and they are living in marital bliss. The honeymoon is on, and they are living it up. And then we turn the corner to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, and there's a play on words because the Hebrew word for naked and the Hebrew word for crafty sound similar to one another. So this play on words, the Bible says, now the serpent. In the midst of this blessed union, in the midst of this incredible honeymoon, the snake shows up. I'm telling you, there's always a snake when you least expect it. I went to my grandmother's house to take a shower one morning. I pulled back the shower curtain and a snake fell out into the tub. I fled naked through the house. That's what happened when I did that. I tried to find something. I was so fired up, I killed that thing with a fly swatter. That's what I did in that (laughs) Always a snake who shows up when you least expect it. And here the snake shows up. And Genesis 3 recounts how the tempter, Satan, prevailed upon the first woman to violate God's command and how her husband willingly followed her into sin. And ever since that day, marriage has resembled and sometimes does resemble more a struggle for control and conscious and unconscious efforts at manipulation than it does an Edenic paradise. The struggle is real. What's happening in Genesis 3? Well, briefly, I would just say about three or four things that the enemy is doing. Number one, uh, he's launching an attack on God's truth. He said to the woman, did God actually say? He's trying to put doubt in her mind about what God has said. Second, about God's authority. Because she responds back to him about what God had said about the prohibition not to eat of the fruit of the tree, lest we die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. He contradicts God blatantly and tries to undermine God's authority. An attack on God's truth, an attack on God's authority. It's an attack on God's character. He says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He is saying to her very craftily, very subtly, God doesn't really have your best interest in mind. Instead, he is trying to withhold something from you that would bless your life, so why don't you go ahead and take it. An attack on God's truth, his authority, his goodness, his character, and on his design, his design. The Bible is very clear that it was intentional that the serpent went to the woman because that was a twisting, a usurping of God's design. 
God had given the man that command to give to his wife and to protect her and to keep her in along with that beautiful garden. And instead of going to the man, he goes to the woman and he beguiles her. And in in case you think that the man is somehow innocent here, where was he? He was apparently with her because the Bible says after she ate that she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And both of them plunged the world headlong into sin. In God, marriage, and family, the authors say the fall witnesses a complete reversal of the roles assigned by God to the man and to the woman. Rather than God being in charge with the man, helped by the woman, ruling creation for him, a complete reversal takes place. Satan approaches the woman who draws the man with her into rebellion against God. And so Eve listens to the voice of the snake. Adam listens to the voice of his wife. And nobody listens to the voice of God. Struggle and the consequences of this sinful choice are immediate. There is guilt. There is shame. There is relational distance and conflict that comes. We'll talk more about that next uh, two weeks from today. And then the rest of the Old Testament chronicles for us a whole series of ways in which sin has affected marital and family relations since this fall. The very next chapter has an instance of fratricide as Cain kills Abel, his brother. In chapter four, polygamy comes, a distortion of God's design. Adultery comes, rape incest, prostitution, all of these corruptions of God's good design, they come to us out of this experience in Genesis chapter number three. And so we face today the consequences of this fateful choice and the struggle comes into our homes now. The struggle is real. It has been from the beginning. It is a struggle from the beginning which continues to this day. A struggle from the beginning which continues to this day. Arguably the most important explicit passage on spiritual warfare in the Bible is Ephesians chapter number six, verses 10 through 20. We've been studying through this passage on Wednesday nights in our adult Bible study. But for this series, there's something that I want to show you that I at first didn't really take notice of, but now I can't miss it. And that is that when you find this passage on spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, it is preceded almost immediately by text that speak about God's instruction regarding marriage and parenting. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, you have God's instruction about wives and husbands in relationship to one another and how that marriage is to be a pointer to the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. You see that there. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, you have instruction for children and for parents. And then, after talking about marriage, and then about children, and about parents, and about our jobs in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse number 5, then you have the passage about spiritual warfare. Is that by accident? I don't think so. In Paul's thinking, it is precisely in these important relationships with one another that spiritual warfare manifests itself and dealing with it becomes a necessity. Friends, spiritual warfare is an ever-present, all-encompassing, ruling reality for the child of God And we see it in our homes 
every day. Why? Because the home was God's first institution for the world, for the good of the world. And the enemy wants nothing more than to try to damage and distort God's good design. So he attacks the family as much as he does anything else. How many of you know that if you commit yourself to know and love the Lord, that you will experience spiritual warfare in your home? I need to bust the bubble of these moms and dads. They brought these beautiful babies in their beautiful outfits. And it was a beautiful day, but you give it about two years and it won't be so beautiful all the time. I can guarantee you that. How many of you have found your hands around the throat of a child you love on Sunday morning? <laughs> you get it together so we can go and learn about the love of Jesus Christ. You do it right now. How many of you know that there are more fights in the car on the way to church on Sunday morning than there are any other time? We ought to begin about every third service on Sunday morning with a call to repentance at the beginning of the service. Just come and get it all out of your system. And kids find stuff to fight about, they make up stuff to fight about. If there's nothing else, they make up stuff. You have a kid in the back seat and sitting by, get another seat and say, Mom, Dad! She's looking at me. I'm sorry she's looking at you. I wish something were different. I'm sorry about that. How many of y'all have gotten good at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the backhand slap? I'm telling you, I, my daddy's arms, he could grow them five foot in the car anywhere we went. I can promise you that. He was so good. He was a good, he could back the car up like, nope. You know why? He got so good at turning that mirror just right to find you where you were to slap you in the back seat. That's how he got so good at it. And then, if he couldn't reach you, you know what he'd do then? Slam the brakes so you come forward in the strike range. That's what he would do. <laughs> Some of y'all's mamas sang in this choir. And the Bible talks about, we read this in, in Psalm 32, that he says, I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. The Bible says he guides us with his eye. Have any of y'all ever been guided by the eye of your mama from the choir? Y'all know what I'm talking about? In the choir. The voice is singing, how great is our God. And the eye says, I'll kill you when this service is over. That's what it says. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Is it just me? Friend, this is a struggle. The struggle is real. It has been from the beginning and it continues to this day. So today, be encouraged. You are not alone. You are not alone. The pastor and his family knows how it feels. My wife becomes a single mom on Sunday mornings. And I can tell when she walks into Sunday school in the connections, whether or not they've had a good morning so far, I can just tell. You are not alone. You are not strange. It is the, it is the experience of every family, and in particular, every Christian family who wants to love the Lord and serve the Lord, and the enemy hates it. So let me give you today as we close four applications, and we'll talk about these in the weeks to come. And I hope that over these next weeks, God will give you help for your fight for your family. Number one, number one, recognize that there is a battle. You cannot be neutral. You can't stick your head in the sand. It is coming for you whether you want it or not. Y'all, some of y'all know by now that I'm a closet nerd. I love 
the Lord of the Rings movies. There's one scene in that where they come to King Theoden of the horse riders and they try to convince him that an army is coming and his army won't make it in time. And he says, I know what you ask of me. And he says, I will not risk open war. And King Aragorn says, open war is upon you whether you would risk it or not. Friends, open war is upon you and upon your family. And to ignore that reality is to do so at your own peril. Number two, know who the real enemy is. Know who the real enemy is. We'll talk about this more next week. But for now, why don't I just give you a sneak preview? Why don't you just bump your husband or your wife or maybe your teenage son or daughter, look at them and say, you are not my enemy. Why don't you just, you know, y'all afraid to say it because y'all don't know, believe that's true. I can see that, all right? <laughs> know who the real enemy is. We'll talk about him in two weeks from today. Third, this battle must be fought with spiritual weapons. This is not a physical battle it's a spiritual battle that must be fought with spiritual weapons. We'll talk about those. And then finally, know this. This is a battle that we can win. Amen. Our God created the family. Our God has blessed the family. And our God can redeem the family. And he will not let the enemy have what he has created. And so in the gospel of the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith in the crucified, dead, buried, and risen Lord Jesus Christ, you can begin again to pursue God's good design for your marriage and your family. But it only comes at the place of repentance and faith. In Ephesians chapter six, he says, finally, be strong, Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Friends, we only win this battle in the strength of the Lord. And the reason why some of you cannot seem to find victory in this area, may it, may it just be that you can't find victory because you don't have the strength of God within you because you've never surrendered to his lordship and to his strengthening Holy Spirit who wants to come and live inside of you, empower you. The controlling idea of this whole section in Ephesians 5 and 6 is this, be filled with the Spirit. You need the empowering help of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you have that? Say, preacher, how can I have it? If you repent of your sin and turn by faith to Jesus Christ. He forgives you of your sin. He secures your eternity. He puts his Holy Spirit inside of you who empowers you to live for his glory. And that means in your life, that means in your marriage, that means in your family, but you will not know victory until you find it in the strength that only God can provide. Amen. But with that strength, he says, you can stand. In this evil day, you can stand. With that in mind, let's stand together just now.